again. It's hey, seven. hey, Rafi. How you doing there? Doing well, James. How about yourself? Uh, I'm doing okay. How's the sound looking? 30 seconds. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Are you pumped for this? I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Yeah. Talking about how the Leap Motion controller works. Okay, floating video. Very, very exciting topic. Okay, we're good. All right, hello. I don't see anyone in the channel. <laughs> you all are coming soon. Great start. Keep going. All right, so um, yeah, this should be a really fun talk today. We're going to go through, um, you know, kind of a history of the Leap Motion peripheral and how it came to be, and kind of show you guys a bunch of prototypes uh, along the way. Um, as you will find out, a lot of the innovation isn't actually in the hardware, it's in our software. So um, that's something that James and I will be talking about quite a bit, is how the software actually takes the hardware streaming data over USB and convert that into what your hands are doing. So uh, yeah, should be a pretty exciting talk today. And as always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to pop into our uh, chat room and let us know. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start, uh, start with the hardware. We, we published a really good article a while back um, from Kyle, one of our industrial designers. And so I would encourage you guys to check that out. Um, what was the name of the article, James? Uh, designing, well, Designing the Leap Motion Controller is one of Kyle's earlier articles. Yeah, Designing the Leap Motion Controller. Check it out. Um, and so we're actually going to be showing a lot of those prototypes uh, here today. So as you can see from that article, the hardware itself is actually pretty simple. So in there, uh, you've got you know a couple of infrared sensors and a few infrared LEDs. And uh, there's a small kind of brain inside the hardware which synchronizes all of the data. So uh, for example, one of the things the brain uh, does is it will only turn on the LEDs when uh, the infrared sensors are taking a picture. And so uh, that helps set, save power and it also uh, improves the life of the LEDs and it gives us better range because we can put more power through the LEDs for a shorter amount of time. So, um, yeah, and then that's pretty much the only other thing that the brain does is it will synchronize the images coming off of the sensor, package them up into a nice uh, packet, and then ship that off over USB uh, to your computer. So, um, that's pretty much it for the hardware. So, uh, so you guys will recognize this, this dude. This is the uh, official Leap Motion controller. It's our only uh, standalone product. We also have a VR mount for this for uh, if you want to mount it on a VR headset. So this is what we came out with, um, geez, almost two years ago now. So we're going to kind of show a bunch of prototypes uh, that led up to this guy. So the first one that we made uh, which we really don't have a code name for. Uh, this is the first, I guess, precursor to the Leap Motion controller. Um, so we don't really have a name for this. I guess we could call it the, the Mark I. Um, so this is missing a bunch of parts in here, but I'll open it up very carefully. As you can see, it's pretty, you know, pretty janky. It's missing a camera, so we just used two off-the-shelf kind of scientific cameras. And uh, at the time, this didn't really have the brain that I was talking about earlier. So we just took two two cameras, and they were streaming to the PC uh, pretty much you know continuously and independently. So we had to run two USB cables over to the PC, um, and that was you know we had to do that for quite quite some time. So. Uh, yeah, and this thing is still, you know, it's still pretty small, but it's obviously huge compared to the final thing that we ship. Um, so after that, we made this guy. Um, this guy actually had a really sick tripod, but I couldn't find it. Um, luckily, this the electronics in this guy are a little bit more intact, so you can see a little bit better what's going on in here. So you got two camera modules. Uh, a switch to control the LEDs, and 
Um, that's pretty much it, just some wiring to hook everything up. So, I guess we could call this the, the Mark II. Then we, um, then we really started to focus on, okay, you know, we've got something that kind of works. What do we, you know, how do we fit into a package that's small enough to be portable and convenient? And so then we made uh, our two next modules, which I think we called the Ultra Series because they were the first ones to incorporate a lot of the production um, spec LEDs that we were going to use uh, for the final version. And so that's what these guys look like. So, pretty small, you know, they'll, they'll fit in the palm of your hand. And the cool thing is that this thing is really modular, so I can go ahead and take out uh, the circuitry from here. So this is what the internals look like. And uh, the LED board can actually be removed carefully. And so this is what is on the core circuit. As you can see, it's pretty much the same as the Mark II. You know, you got a couple of camera modules in there and some wiring, but now it's all hooked up into a kind of self-contained circuit, so it's a lot smaller. Um, yeah. And so for those of you who watched our original uh, kind of announcement video from uh, May of 2012, those were filmed using these, uh, these pr uh, prototypes. So, yeah. and then that's kind of where that's kind of where the really janky prototypes ended, and then we started focusing more on uh, production-oriented modules. So James here is holding our Rev three module. Um, this one is the first one to have a onboard USB controller, the Brain that I referred to earlier, and so instead of requiring two USB cables, uh, now we only need one. And we can also strobe the LEDs and do things like that that I was mentioning earlier. Um, so that one's the, the Rev3. And then this one is a, another path that we were experimenting with, which is to make a super, super small uh, module. Um, and I mean, this one's just like, it's just really small, you know. And a bulk of that height is from the lenses, you know. Question from the audience. <coughs> so why is the live stream from the IR lenses a bit low? Will it change in the next version? The live stream from the IR lens is a bit low. Uh, frame rate. Do you yeah. mean the frame rate or the, ah. the brightness? I guess um, the brightness is automatically controlled by our software. So if you put an object really close, then uh, we have an automatic exposure algorithm, which will kind of adjust the brightness and keep everything in a relatively the decent the uh, brightness range. The quality of the video. Um, the quality of the video, uh, I mean, you could always change. Do we still allow mode changes? I don't think we do anymore. Uh, it actually, no, it's actually hidden. It, is, it actually yeah. is enabled in a later version of E2. Um, so, yeah, one thing you could try is changing the mode of your device. Um, like the default mode is kind of the balanced mode, which runs at uh, 115 frames per second. and. Um, 640 by 240 resolution per sensor. That's correct. And so that's kind of saying, okay, we're going to take half of the data from the sensor and run it twice the frame rate. And that keeps everything more responsive. If you want better image quality, then you can say, okay, we're going to use the full uh, image instead of taking only half. But then obviously you're going to sacrifice a little bit of frame rate in the process. Um, yeah, virtual edition says it's not even 720p. That's correct. These are VGA cameras, so the highest. Uh, resolution you get is 640 by 480. Uh, yeah. So all of the prototypes that we've shown so far are, uh, yeah, just VGA mm -hmm. resolution. So if you're looking for higher resolution, then uh, that's a hardware limitation. If you want just like kind of a higher quality image uh, from what you see already, then, um, you know, you can do a number of uh, noise reduction algorithms or use a higher resolution uh, setting for... Uh, the tracking mode. So yeah, let's continue on with our history of the controller. Um, after this guy, you know, then we got to the the final 
consumer design, which I showed earlier. Then, uh, for those of you who have the HP NV laptop with uh, Leap Motion built in, this is the module that uh, is actually inside there. And you can see a bulk of that size is actually this metal back plate to keep it straight. Um, but this is an extremely small module, really, really small. And that's how we fit it into the uh, little corner of the keyboard. So we're using, you know, really, really small lenses, as you can see, uh, to get it that, that thin. So, um, yeah, this took a pretty, pretty good effort of engineering to get it that small. We're really proud of that. Then some other prototypes that we have. These are not products, these are just uh, projects that we kind of are working on internally. Thoughts on the HoloLens? Uh, we were told not to uh, go, go down that route. <laughs> HoloLens is cool, I like it. Um, I, I think maybe we should focus on the gestures there. So the gesture they demonstrated in HoloLens, I think there's a question here, it says, uh, basically, you know, why does this thing? With an advanced link tracking system built in, and the answer is no, there is not an advanced link tracking system in HoloLens. Uh, AirTouch is this, uh, I think it's, it actually uses gaze tracking, so it doesn't matter where your finger is, but if you move your gaze, you can do this binary touch, and that's what they've currently advertised, but, um, you know, we'll, all the best for, uh, you know, hopefully the gesture interfaces will improve over time when HoloLens and other interfaces. Yeah, I mean, I, I love this whole field, so the more, uh, you know, the more kind of VR, AR stuff there is, the more excited I am. You know, everybody's gonna come out with cool ideas and nothing is gonna have all of the good ideas. And so each thing that comes out is gonna have um, some cool stuff. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to using it. Um, so some modules that you may have read about in articles, uh, like we had a, a Mercedes car at CES using our Meadowhawk module, and that's this guy. Um, the main difference is that it's using uh, more robust sensors and a lot more LEDs. So in a car, you know, you have uh, sun, and so you have to have enough power to kind of overcome the sunlight that's going to be in the car. And that's what this module was explicitly designed to do. It's kind of an industrial grade, really good module. Um, again, this is just a prototype, not an official product yet. And then another module that you may have heard about is Dragonfly, and that's this dude. Um, pretty small, again, just a prototype, but um, you know we're still working on this. We're really excited about it. Um, this the Dragonfly module has HD color sensors for the first time, as opposed to VGA uh, black and white um, images. So. So yeah, I mean that takes us through all the hardware that um, that we've kind of worked on, the history of the the controller, and you know where we are now and where we're headed in the future. Um, so the thing with the the thing that all the modules have in common is they're all using infrared light, and so that's why even though they're illuminating your hand, you don't really see that because it's in a wavelength that your eye. Uh, is unable to pick up on. And so um, to the device, your hand actually appears very bright, even if to you it looks black. And so if you look at our image API, you can actually see what the device sees, which is that your hand is kind of white and then the background is black. Um, in VR, you have a little bit of a different problem because the sensor is mounted uh, on the headset. And in that case, you know, you're gonna see some background objects like your desk or your monitor, and um, you know that's a little bit trickier, but it's kind of cool to see that. It kind of gives you this AR feeling. So, um, but pretty much, if you have other devices that work in infrared, then there really shouldn't be any conflict there. So, uh, I guess from narrowband we can talk about we we pulse our LEDs. So they're not on all the time. So yeah. So they're on briefly. Hopefully, anything else will be off seeing. Because she's two leaps close by in a room and they uh, don't interfere. And yeah, a narrow band of red, such that hopefully any other device will use a different band. Um, there are some known conflicts like NVIDIA 3D Vision, although that isn't as popular nowadays with VR and all. So, <laughs> so on the bright side, yeah, we work fine with even the LEDs on, on the Oculus uh, Crescent Bay, which has a ton of LEDs. We don't interfere there. Yeah. All right. Anything?
thing about uh, talk about interaction space. Yeah. So one thing that we kind of were tweaking for a long time is the uh, the interaction volume. Basically, how big of a space do you want to track? So um, it's a little bit of an interesting trade-off because you know for the same sensor resolution, you can either track a wider field of view or um, you know more accuracy. And there's kind of a trade-off there. If you have a really, really wide field of view, then your hand will be here very small, but you can move around quite a bit. Whereas if you have a narrow field of view, then that'll give you things like higher range, but you can't move around as much. Question um, from the audience. Is <coughs> any possibility about having larger areas in the future, larger, or larger ranges in the future, maybe a dedicated VR gesture modules in the future models? Uh, I mean, yeah, we're obviously the bigger the range is, you know, the better the experience. But show the metal box? Yeah. Uh, it's a trade off, right? Because, like, this thing has really, really good range, but this is way too big to put in a VR headset. And so, plus, this draws a lot of power. And, um, you know, for a VR headset, a lot of them are going to be kind of limited to USB spec. And so, um, that's way too much power to be drawing over USB. Um, so, you know, design is all about like trade-offs and compromises, right? You're probably not going to want this thing in your in your VR headset. You're probably going to want something more like this, and uh, this guy, you know, doesn't draw nearly as much power, um, but the range isn't also as as good. So, um, you know, one one cool thing about all this is that. Uh, even with the same hardware, we can just continue to improve the software, and um, that way we can kind of extract free improvements out of the same physical uh, specifications. And so uh, that's one of the things that you're going to see the biggest improvement uh, with us over time is actually improving the software so that all current hardware will actually get better, as opposed to having to constantly buy new modules. Um, and we think that's a better, you know, deal for the user is they buy the hardware relatively mm -hmm. infrequently and then um, the software updates kind of continuously improves their experience. Yeah, one thing I'll say about range before we go on to the next question um, is um, is uh, one thing that's, that's purely software is uh, it's using multiple leaps. So, you know, um, we've, ex we've talked about this in the forums a bit, but yeah, imagine two leaps uh, connected to your desktop and you've, you can double your range in that sense. And we have some experimental work ongoing with this, but no... Uh, no clear timeline of when that'll be released, but that's one way to increase range. Of course, that has the drawback of twice as much power but, and a lot more computation uh, using power as well. Um, but those are some of the ideas we're looking at. Um, one of the other uh, questions that led to this was, have we looked at uh, other sensors like uh, time of flight or uh, structured light sensors? I think we, and we, and we have early on, maybe Rocky was here before me, so perhaps you can talk to some of the sensors we've looked at and ruled out or that may have promise. Yeah, so, um, I guess kind of going off of the whole design trade-offs uh, theme, you know, early on we knew that it was really important to build a human interface. Um, things like 3D object scanning or, uh, you know, creating a full point cloud of your room, um, those were things that are really cool, but you can't do all of the cool things, and we thought that those had more uh, work to solve them than just a pure hand tracking solution. And so if you start out really early on knowing that you want to track hands, then that kind of informs your design decisions. So uh, using a time of flight sensor, for example, is great for uh, getting 3D object scans or you know giving you a point cloud of a room or things like that. Uh, but if you actually hold a hand in front of a time of flight sensor, you you know, the resolution isn't really that great for allowing for really fine uh, interactions. And so, uh, you know, if you're interacting with a TV and you're just doing, you know, broad gestures like that, it's probably okay. But we knew we really wanted to have deep, you know, sub-millimeter, low latency, really high fidelity interactions, and it's just hard uh, to get that out of any commercial type of flight sensor on the market, at least right now. Um, that's obviously changing. Uh, over time, yeah, and as that changes, we uh, we continue to, to 
uh, a lot of these things are public, like the Intel RealSense SDK. Uh, you can use it, and we've, we try it among various other solutions. Um, and as David likes to say, um, if, you know, if time of flight or structured light uh, became a solution that, that actually did give us the accuracy that we we wanted, uh, we, we could we could even switch that. Our our algorithms are actually pretty independent. We've been able to test them on different sorts of. Uh, types of cameras, uh, including structured light and time of flight. Um, now, those of you who've used the Intel RealSense SDK, it, it, its resolution isn't, isn't, where it, uh, isn't close to our 7 millimeter accuracy, but that could change over time as well as other uh, time of flight or structured light or pattern of light solutions. Yeah, <coughs> that's definitely true. Um, we had a question about Android <coughs> and the Motion SDK. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, virtualization, Virtualizations asked about uh, our Android SDK, so uh, and particularly Google Cardboard Gear VR. So I have here a, a cardboard. Um, this here is a leap. This here is a mount. Uh, I don't have my Nexus Five or Nexus Six in here at the moment, but you wouldn't be able to see me if I put it, see what I'm seeing if I put it on anyhow. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we have an Android SDK, and the primary use now is actually for for virtual reality. Um, so, uh, so in the uh, Android uh, Alpha. You can get access to a number of examples, mostly in Unity, although some in Java, uh, for using Leap uh, uh, with uh, for VR, particularly with cardboard or or the Gear VR. Uh, Virtualization is also asked about the power usage and performance. So right now, performance isn't where we want it to be, and that's one reason it's alpha. So uh, so I, uh, those of you who've used it, I think you, on, on a good phone, you can achieve maybe 55 frames per second. It's not the 120 frames per second that we really want to get to. Um, so we're working on that at this time. Um, so and and we're using uh, at least more like one and a half cores, uh, as well as streaming a lot of IR light out. It's, it actually will drain the battery a lot. So we're working on hardware and software innovations to improve that. Um, but for now, it's in a private alpha, which you can all request to get access to if you're a developer. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, still, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for mobile VR versus say tethered VR. Tethered VR, the cord around you, and it's just really hard to share it with somebody. You have to bring them into your office and tie them up. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we, we see a lot of potential with, with mobile VR, and um, hope those in the Android uh, uh, Alpha SDK, we'd like to see what you can do with either the Cardboard SDK or the Gear VR Oculus Mobile SDK. Uh, a user writes, I haven't used Leap since it upgraded to V2 software. Uh, previously didn't handle tracking very well. If you rotated the device on the side, uh, has it changed since early V1? Okay, I think I could talk to, uh, uh, device on its side. So uh, what uh, uh, Jobo Jim is referring to is, uh, is let's say we have a table, and a lot, in fact we did a survey of, but, uh, of what developers are doing, where they use a device like this, use it in VR, uh, use it on a wall, use it in the ceiling, and a surprising number, uh, I think probably as many as 10%, still wanted this mode, which we call table mode. Uh, so, uh, and we were interested in this early on as well. Um, uh, in part because a lot of people think of things like a virtual trackpad or a virtual keyboard. And we've done a number of experiments with, experiments with this. Um, um, even it tried some apps, tried some writing uh, apps. Uh, right now, it, because of the amount of work uh, it multiplies every time we, we support bottom-up, VR, uh, ceiling mounted, uh, we, we haven't been able to, to uh, focus on this at this time. Uh, but we do believe a lot of potential. In fact, uh, even V2 brought us a bit closer to this by tracking a skeleton. Uh, we're closer to uh, being able to track hands when they're, even if there's interfering, if there's basically a table you can see. Um, another thing for people who really want to do this, uh, for, for auto orientations, if they use black, um, using a, a matte black um, covering, you can do some experience of different orientations. So that that's what people have been doing. Uh, other people have put things through transparent glass in order to put a table above the leap and do things like a trackpad. Uh, but yeah, we apologize that table mode still isn't a focus at, at this time, but we, we understand the potential for it and uh, have, have tried to keep track of it in our uh, developer surveys. I think V2 would do better with mm -hmm. table mode compared to the V1 tracking, but mm -hmm. it's still not, mm -hmm. you know, <coughs> it's still not an officially supported mode in our software. Um, so if you really want it, you know, let us know and we'll work on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back to virtualizations asked, do we have Unity integration for Android? And yes. Unity is the primary SDK uh, that we put all our examples in for Android. Uh, the same thing happened with uh, with Oculus. Uh, they put out a C++ SDK and a Unity SDK, but 90% of the developers were using Unity, and the majority of ours are too. And just so easy to have a desktop application that just press a button and export to Android. So yeah, we focus on Unity for Android integration. All right.
love you too. I just want to make one other uh, point about alternative uh, sensor hardware. Um, so if you look at the cost of just a standard infrared or even a color uh, sensor that we have in the peripheral. Sorry, Rafi, they um, said they love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, gloves, how does it affect tracking? Gloves? Yeah. Uh, as long as they're fairly matte, it should be fine. You know, it might think you have a really big hand, but as long as it's a fairly thin glove that's not too shiny, it should, should be fine. You can always open up the visualizer and see what the glove looks like. If it looks relatively uh, kind of, you know, uh, you know, it's not like sparkly or, you know, reflecting or blinding the device and it's relatively hand-shaped, like a mitten will probably not work if it's just one big, uh, one big pocket for all the fingers, but if you have individual fingers, then it's, it's probably good. Like a black shiny leather glove probably won't work, but it depends on, you know, the specific material. So always, you know, you can always open up the visualizer and take a look. Um, but yeah, one other point about so sensor hardware is uh, the sensors that we're using as of today are much, much lower cost for the quality that you get in terms of the user experience. And so, um, you know, kind of natural 3D sensors that do all the processing in hardware, um, like structured light or time of flight, they're, they're just expensive right now and they consume a lot of power and they're big. And so, um, you know, absolutely they'll get to the point where they would need to be, but right now, you know, we, we just kind of evaluated the trade-offs for our uh, first-generation peripheral, and we decided that, you know, uh, sticking to regular uh, sensors was going to be the way to go, at least for now. But like James said, you know, we already have tested our software on a lot of these things, and uh, when the time comes, you know, we'll be ready. Um, user writes, I've been surprised by IR light, reflect, or IR light reflects things that I don't expect it to. Uh, users wouldn't be aware of the lack of... Uh, contrast unless they actually look at the IR video feeds. Are there solutions to this and will we use visible light in the near future? That's a really good question. So, um, can I, I can answer the latter question. Will we use visible light? Um, well, I can't say never, but I feel it's unlikely. If you look at all the other solutions, you know, Intel RealSense or HoloLens or Connect, uh, the reason people use infrared is, well, you can't see it, so you don't see light spamming everywhere. Um, <laughs> and if you want something that's robust against sunlight, you've got to be able to, to have something that, and so, sunlight has IR too, but at least if we compete against that, it, if, you, if you compete against the sun, you'd see weird lights everywhere. So I don't believe visible light will be uh, a future uh, solution to that. Uh, that said, there may be other solutions, and maybe Rafi can talk about the problem. And yeah, those. I mean, the main point of using visible light mm -hmm. so far that we've found wouldn't actually be to uh, improve tracking, although that that could be the case. Uh, actually, be to enable kind of AR applications. Is let's say you have uh, you know full color sensor mounted on a head mounted display, then um, even without like transparent glasses, if you have a full opaque you know VR headset with this type of sensor mounted on the front, you can still see the world around you in full color and. Um, you know, that's a really huge thing for, for AR applications because then you have the 3D tracking, you have uh, natural color as if it were, you know, the real world, and then you can place arbitrary 3D objects and interact with them uh, in full AR. And so that's the main use case that I would see from visible light. Um, but, maybe, but yeah. maybe we can get back to, like, how do we deal with IR reflects off things you don't expect. Um, which can cause interference, and people would have to open the visualizer to actually see that happen. Yeah, so that's that seems like a really good uh, kind of like UX problem, right? Because a developer will know to open up the visualizer and say, oh, wow, there's a metal pipe on my ceiling that's blinding the device. Or, um, you know, in VR, they have the head mounted, uh, the device mounted on their head, and they look, and the, there's a huge amount of glare coming off of their monitor, right? Um, so it's very easy for a developer to find out these things. It would be great to have a tool that would tell kind of an average user uh, not only that something is reflecting, but also where the reflection is coming from. We don't have a tool like that today, but that seems like a pretty 
a good idea for something to, to do, you know? Like we added the, the smudge warning or the warning when your device is out of calibration. Maybe we can add like a, uh, you know, like a reflective object warning. And that way people can know not to put their Coke cans or, uh, you know, have mirrors lying around when they're using a device. So it's a really good suggestion. Anthony, what's the next question that we should take? There's like four um, in the queue. So, <laughs> sorry, there's a lot. So, <laughs> belief becoming an augmented interface is more than a tracking interface. Do you agree or disagree? Augmented interface versus tracking interface. And I think, so I would think that's in VR. It's augmented reality. Tracking for, like hand tracking? Yeah, like how the- Yeah, video pass through versus hand tracking. Yeah, image interactive. So, um, for AR, yeah, you would need, you need more than just hands. You need the, you need a video pass through in there. Uh, for VR, you can go either way. Um, so for VR, a lot of the efforts, like if you go to our dev portal, um, those are mainly just using the hand tracking. So like we have a really cool planetarium uh, app and uh, that one, you know, makes a great use of, of the hand tracking in VR. Um, but then, you know, you can always make hybrid solutions. So one thing that we've seen in a few apps is to take the image API and then use the tracking to make a cutout of the image API in 3D and then paste that onto your, uh, onto your view. And so this is kind of a hybrid, right? So you're using the image API, but you're also using the tracking. And so what this does is it puts your real hand as seen by the device into VR but it also gets rid of all the other stuff in the background. So all you see from the image API is the hands. And so this is, there's a lot of room for experimentation here. And uh, we found that this hybrid approach works really well. And uh, a few developers have kind of, uh, you know, independently put it in and it's not too hard to do. So there's a lot of, a lot of room here for experimentation. Yeah, um, we should talk about other issues besides reflective objects. I think uh, it was, Virtualization, virtualization is an issue with the hovercast menu. For those who haven't seen it, it's uh, oh yeah, yeah, you use hands here. But you know, as soon as you put a hand, two hands in front of another, um, yeah, you've got occlusion here, and and yeah, hands can disappear. Uh, so uh, occlusion is is a challenge that uh, that that we deal with. I mean, we have two cameras that are fairly close together, and you can occlude something completely from it. Um, yeah, one solution we've potential solution is multiple devices that if I have, again, if I have yeah, yeah, two leaps, they can see the hand from different angles. So uh, sometimes it becomes easier to even handle when they're occluded from one camera, from one leap, and see them, uh, you can still see them from the other leap. Uh, so that's one idea. Uh, but the occlusion is, is a challenge for pretty much any tracking interface, whether it's Connect or us. If you block something, uh, it's hard to track it. Yeah, I mean, even if you, you know, hold your hand away uh, from your face, then you know, you move your thumb behind your palm and you move your thumb, there's no way you can see it with your eyes. And so we have the same problem. Okay, um, I think I can say one more thing about, about the hardware. Um, so as, as Rafi covered, you know, in any of these devices, we've got our, our basic, our lenses, our, our filters, our LEDs, some more than others, um, and the USB chip. The, the, the chip on the uh, peripheral, uh, it's one that a lot of people know is the Cypress FX3. Uh, the chip in this, uh, this module you sign and HP is, a, is one made by Omnivision, um, but that's a USB chip, and USB chips actually USB 3 capable. Some of you may have noticed that the plug here, we can see this plug, um, this is, um, that's a USB 3 plug, and you come, you get this cable, it looks like a USB 3 cable. It's actually a USB 2 cable, but, uh, but it fits. Um, but, but our, uh, the device is, the hardware is, is at least USB 3 capable. So, um, so, uh, let's see, the bandwidth's, uh, for, um, See a USB uh, three bandwidth is let's see, I think it's ten times. Ten, about ten x USB yeah. two. Ten x USB two. Yeah. So currently Probably. we can yeah we can do one hundred twenty frames per second, but you can you can actually raise that a lot on USB three if needed, or raise the resolution uh, while keeping the uh, and uh, you can even raise the resolution and the uh, and the, the frame rate. There are limitations to the cameras on there as well, but but there's potential. We haven't released a, a new firmware to support that because USB three has all sorts of problems. In fact, people using the connect uh, the connect SDK. 
there's, they have all these USB 3 problems. We actually have enough problems with USB 2, given all the different <laughs> host controllers. So, uh, so yeah, we, we haven't released our USB 3 firmware yet, um, but, but we have been uh, testing this internally for a while, because we are always testing the full range of, uh, of you know, what our product can do under you know, different constraints. The current state of the USB 3 is, mm -hmm. if you have a good computer with like a good host controller and a good cable, then USB 3 will work great. If you don't have those things, then you get a really crappy experience. And so it's a trade-off between do we make some people more happy at the expense of everyone, or do we kind of keep everyone able to have a decent experience? Uh, and right now, kind of what James was alluding to, in uh, just to give you an idea of the benefit, the last time I had messed with USB 3, you know, in the super high speed mode with USB 2, you might get something like 235, 240 frames per second. With USB 3, that gets pushed up to about 290 or 300. And so, what is that? That's like a maybe 30%, 20% difference depending on which mode you're in. And when we looked at that, it was a really cool feature to have, but it wasn't one of those game breaking things that we were saying, okay, we're gonna go ahead and break compatibility with a whole bunch of people just to have this feature of you know higher frame rates. Um, and so we kind of made that decision and decided that uh, until we have a way that has no compromise for people who don't have as good USB controllers, that we're not going to put out a solution for that. Um, although one other thing that I'll say about USB is that USB 3 can actually reduce latency. So if you're looking at kind of a, a future looking uh, VR oriented uh, integration that has a USB 3 uh, port built in, then that might be actually a really good place to use uh, USB 3. But, um, you know, we don't have anything to announce at this time for that. Yeah, on, on the mobile side, most phones are all USB 2, so yeah. we're limited there. Um, and USB itself has a bit of overhead for, for a mobile device. And in fact, I don't have my Android phone here, but the camera like the camera that you use to take pictures on your phone, it's not, it's not going through USB. It's uh, this tighter interface called camera serial interface. So, so we're, we're, we're looking into, although this takes a lot of hardware investment, ways to, to not use USB there, just, just like the existing camera. Um, other innovations include, include a USB uh, 3.1 with the USB Type-C connector. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, USB 3.1 we can, we can support even higher bandwidth. Um, the connector itself, uh, I like the idea that, you know, I hope the next generation Apple might, you know, put that, replace Lightning and put that connector in. Like, we have an Android SDK, but no Apple SDK, so that would be one blocker out of the way. Of course, there's other blockers, so I think that covers a lot we could say about USB. All right, I think there's not a few questions. I think you could finally get to talking about the tracking. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we were kind of, we were kind of covering some of this in our hardware overview, but, um, just to kind of go through it again, are, um, like if any of you have seen the raw data coming out of a Kinect or out of a time of flight sensor, it's a, it's a depth map, it's a point cloud. So that's basically an image where each pixel, instead of giving you a color, is telling you how far away that pixel is from the sensor. And so um, it's a really cool technology and uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how far sensors like that have come. And then, you know, in self-driving cars and things like that, they're only going to be even more important um, because, you know, for detecting arbitrarily shaped objects, like you can't really do much better than, than having a dense uh, depth map of the whole scene. Um, but that being said, depth maps, if you're only doing hand tracking, we didn't feel like depth maps were the right approach because what you end up doing is spending a whole bunch of computation on stuff that doesn't really end up mattering. And so it's wasting a lot of CPU cycles. So um, like you can go online and download uh, a computer vision package called OpenCV and you can have two webcams and then you can do a process called uh, dense stereo reconstruction and what that does is it takes an image and it identifies interesting features in the image and then it takes the other image and does the same thing and then tries to match them up. And then this gives you uh, a similar thing to a, a dense uh, depth map that you might get out of the Kinect. And uh, I would encourage you to do this and then look at your CPU usage and how, uh, what the frame rate is of that application. 
And what you might see is that even if you were to have that and use it for hand tracking, it wouldn't be very good. So you're going to do all that computation for something that's going to give you less accuracy, higher latency, and uh, much more uh, CPU usage. It's not really the right way to go if all you're doing is tracking hands. Um, I mean, obviously, if you want to do 3D object scanning, you don't really have much of a choice. You have to have a depth map for that or some very intelligent uh, way to construct an actual 3D scene. So yeah, underneath, we made that design choice that if we're going to focus on hand tracking, it's not as important to have a full depth map of the scene. So the first thing that our software does after it gets the images off of USB <coughs> is it actually kind of segments out you know, the interesting parts. And so uh, if you have your head in the scene, we try to get rid of your head. Or if there's your cat walking in the field of view, we try to get rid of your cat. And that way, you know, you kind of keep only the focus on the hand instead of reconstructing everything. Rafi, uh, will you be supporting two Leap Motion controllers either on the same computer or through a network control uh, to control a Unity scene? Similar, like, what people have been talking yeah, about. I think we need to make clear that multiple device support, we've experimented with it. We can't give any, any ETA for that since <coughs> it opens up a lot of complications. And, uh, and our focus now is on VR, uh, generally, with a power yeah. envelope where you don't have two devices. So multiple devices, we do kind of have a demo. Um, if you want to just get it working, you can do that today. And you've been able to do that for a long time. Um, for example, I saw a project uh, somebody did a few months ago where they took, uh, they took a, leap, uh, a leap controller and attached them all to a, a big beefy computer and ran a bunch of virtual machines on the computer and then had a leap service running on each virtual machine. And then they had all of them streaming their output using our uh, WebSocket API to kind of like a, a combiner application that looked at all of the output and then uh, knew the offsets between each device and was able to reconstruct the scene. Now, this will work and you can do it today, but it won't be as good as how, it, how good it could theoretically be. Um, and what James was saying, like we, we have a demo and we've had a demo for some time of it kind of working uh, the good way, right? It's just, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs that go into it. You have to have a very capable USB uh, subsystem. It uses way more power. Um, the devices at the moment have to remain kind of fixed within relative to one another. So let's say if you have one device on your desk and another device mounted on your head, then that, that's going to break. And you know that's that's today. You know maybe later we'll uh, improve that. Um, but you know there's just too many too many trade-offs and uh, compromises for us to be happy with it. Um, I can tell you that when it works, it works well, but the same can be said for the solution that you can make uh, today using the WebSocket API. And so we're looking at this thing that's like, okay, is this solution good enough to justify all of the compromises and trade-offs that you would get? And right now, the answer is no. As we put more work into it, uh, you know, obviously things will improve. <coughs> Okay, let's uh, answer a question from uh, in the virtualization asked about uh, Project Tango. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so so Google has uh, this project. I think it's still active. Like they were active at GDC. There was a booth for Project Tango. Of uh, there's a Tango phone. There's a Tango tablet. And just like the Intel Realsense test SDK, some of you are even on that program, and it's you can get access to those. So uh, Project Tango does has it has a camera just like any phone. Um, it actually has an infrared camera and. And the camera in there, the OB7251, is actually the same infrared camera as in, as in here. Um, it has at least one of those, but it also has an additional uh, uh, PMB type time of flight camera in there too. That's the more expensive solution with somewhat low resolution for a dev app that we talked about. So it's What's like, a PMB? Uh, uh, one of those. One of those, or structured lights, yeah. or one or the other. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that can scan the room, but but. The Project Tango isn't known to track hands or, or really even scan close range objects. It's more about hyperlocation and things that are far away. Um, so, uh, but but Google, like us, does look at a lot of three uh, D three uh, D things, whether it's tracking or scanning, hyperlocation. Um, but yeah, I think it's cool that we can relate to them, and since we have the same sensor here. Okay, I think let's have Rafi finish more about tracking before we get on to their APIs. And yeah. This. So, I mean. 
I guess one thing that a lot of people come to us is, you know, strengths and weaknesses. What do you guys do well and what do you guys not do so well? Um, the main one that we see that uh, people um, assume that our software does, which it actually doesn't, is that full point cloud depth map type stuff. Um, so they say, I want to take my leap and, you know, point it at some piece of pottery and I want to bring that pottery into 3D. Um, this isn't something that our software does built in. Like we don't need to spend all that computation building a full 3D point cloud of, of something if, all we, if we know it's going to be a hand, right? Um, now the cool thing is that ever since uh, a few months ago with our image API out there, especially since uh, one of our most recent pass patches greatly reduced the latency of the image API, and so you can build any type of you know, stereo 3D reconstruction algorithm you want on top of our image API, as long as it conforms to our uh, SDK agreement. So um, if you want to mess around with some, uh, you know, there's, you could download a Python high level computer vision library, use our image API in there, and uh, you know, be up and running with a quick hobby project and see what comes up and uh, yeah, the only thing is I would, I would encourage you to take a look at your CPU usage because that'll tell you why we haven't <laughs> emphasized that in our, in our work. Um, there's a lot of libraries in the DeepMotion SDK. Um, do you, do you oh, you okay, yeah, yeah, it's on my queue. Um, I guess as we wrap up tracking, Robbie's talked about the strengths and weaknesses. Um, the, um, you mentioned filtering. Well, I guess I'm not sure we mentioned filtering, but uh, any way you want to wrap it up, Rocky? Yeah, I mean, or latency. I guess kind of one of the things is you know where is tracking going, right? Um, to give you to give you a little bit of idea of that, our V1 tracking was um, kind of the first viable tracking that we came up with. Believe it or not, we have a lot of tracking algorithms that we throw out um, because they're just either use too much CPU or they're too noisy or you know. They have trade-offs that we, we don't want to uh, accept. And so our V1 tracking was the first one that we felt was worthwhile. Um, but you know, it has problems where, uh, you know, if you make a fist, for example, it loses track of your fingers. And this was partially intentional, partially just the way that the algorithm worked. So V1 tracking was much more about um, every frame would extract a full hand model and then you know, it would kind of look at the raw data and segment out what is a finger and what is a tool and things like that. And then it would try to match that up over time. So then if you make a fist, all of the fingers go away and so it thinks that there's no fingers anymore. And um, this is great if you're gonna do things like pointing, but if you want really rich grabbing or pinching, uh, it's not so great. And so that's when our V2 tracking comes into play. Uh, the V2 tracking isn't just looking for fingers and, and you know, tools and stuff, it's actually looking for a whole model of the hand. And so that's what lets us be robust to uh, occlusion. Because if all we see is uh, the palm, for example, and your fingers are outside the field of view, we can extrapolate where the fingers are because we know that the fingers are connected to the palm. And this sounds really simple and intuitive, but we weren't doing this in V1, and it's something that we added in V2. Um, so there's this, there's this kind of jump there where V1 is kind of extracting a model of the hand uh, every time and V2 instead is, is matching a temporal model with the data instead. And so, uh, you know, where we're going is to make that same stuff way more accurate, way more robust, reduce the computation, make it work, you know, longer ranges and things like that. Um, and we have a lot of work going on that internally. And uh, any of you who've been developing with V2 for some time can see the difference between you know, the first public beta of V2 and the final you know, production one shipping today. You know, that's, that kind of gives you an indication of uh, the type of progress that you know, will continue going forward. So yeah, I mean, especially for VR, you know, we need to be more robust to backgrounds, you know, have longer range so you can stick your hands all the way out, 
um, make better use of AR applications. So one thing in particular is in VR, if the, if the model jitters, it's like a really irritating thing, right? Like you can kind of feel it in your spine, like when the hand model jitters when in VR, because if you use it for a few minutes, it starts to become an extension of your brain. And then when it jitters, you actually, it kind of takes you out of the experience. And so this is a big focus for us in VR, is making it so that you almost don't have to think about the tracking. It's just working, and you can focus on what it is that you're doing, and thinking about the tracking kind of goes away. And that way, um, one of our developers, Isaac, uh, he was, he's done uh, these Twitch things before, and he told me once that the leap isn't the interface. Your hand is the interface. And I think that's the right way to look at it, right? We want to get to a point where you're just doing natural hand motions and uh, the software is interpreting that and, and doing everything it needs to do to keep you in the experience as opposed to making you have to think about, oh, I have to put my hand back in this way so it'll uh, reinitialize. So um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. That was a really good way to wrap tracking. OK. Uh, point of voice, tool tracking. Uh, I think we should probably answer the API questions first. OK. I'll take these in the queue. Um, so, um, yeah, we're going to talk a bit what's more downstream that after we track hands and things go through, uh, out through our service to our API and uh, is it virtualizations or uh, somebody asked about uh, uh, how do we prioritize languages. Um, so, uh, sorry, that was, that was Jobo. Yeah, so Jobo GM. Um, yeah, it's a large company. How do we prioritize? There's multiple languages. You know, you, uh, you prefer C Sharp uh, on Unity. That's most of our developers. And we have and we have Python, Java, C++, but but you know if we spend too much time in Python, will that detract from community support? So uh, yeah, this has been a struggle for us uh, from the start. We didn't know which languages would be most popular, so we we uh, we kind of just put out mostly it was mostly just C sharp, Python, and Java uh, and, and C++ initially, and uh, JavaScript kind of came along later. Uh, and over time, we've taken surveys to see what languages are the most popular. Uh, so uh, and we've we've taken this feedback. I think we actually had more time improving JavaScript earlier on, as so there were a lot of cool investigative creations. Uh, but as we move more into VR, Unity has become that more important. There's really not a lot of stuff in, well, there, there's Moz VR, but it's, but due to latency issues, it's somewhat behind the kinds of demos you may see in, um, in Unity. But we can't abandon it. There's still amazing demos in JavaScript, like Isaac's Rainbow Membrane. So, <laughs> uh, so we, we support things. But in some cases, we've neglected some things on purpose, like for Python, uh, a lot of com some companies have better Python APIs, you know, say Braintree or PayPal. Uh, you know, they they because that's what the developers use. Um, our Python API it, it works at Python two. We haven't supported Python three really. In fact, what we do is we say we tell people how they can hack up their own Python three. That doesn't even work for Blender, and that, there's a mix there. Um, so and that's sort of been intentional. Even and even outside of Unity for C sharp. There aren't that many .NET 4.5 developers, so we haven't pr pr provided a .NET 4.5 binding. Um, and we tell people how to make that themselves. Um, so we, we generally take into the feedback of what languages to support or not support. Uh, we get niche requests, for, niche requests for things like Ruby or Lisp, um, and uh, yeah, we have Lisp API. Yeah. So <laughs> and and I think accordingly we look at the numbers and then and then decide how to support them. Um, that said, uh, early on decision uh, quite. Uh, we made a decision to, to use for at least three of our languages, we use this thing called SWIG, which stands for Simplified Wrapper Interface G Generator. The idea that we have our, our leap.h uh, header interface file and generate wrappers for several other languages. At the time, it was just Python and, and Java. Um, and uh, so, uh, Python, sorry, Python, Java, and C Sharp. Um, and, oh, and, yeah, and that, that helps. That supports C as well as C++. Um, and it's helped a lot because our API was designed to be easier than, say, the Connect API from the start or OpenNI. Um, so it wanted to be object oriented. That you, you know, you're getting frames. Your frame has a hand. Your hand has fingers. Your and your and now with skeleton, your finger has bones. Not like allocate some context and do some weird query structure. Um, so we made it object oriented from the start. And Swig has helped a lot there that, that the APIs it generates are object oriented, whether it's in Python or Java or, or C sharp. Those are all object oriented, and that's. That's uh, helped us maintain things. That said, because it's not a like a custom Python solution, it doesn't work uh, as well as some other solutions that use, say, C types. And we've accepted that trade-off to 
to make our development more, more rapid. Um, and while, while using this, we still have some focus on, on things like Unity. Like recently, we, we upgraded to Unity 5 support, which required some custom Unity things. We made the image API much faster in Unity, which required looking at what's going on and then uh, putting a special image API uh, fast copy in there to replace the old one. So, uh, so yeah, we take overall, we, do, we are aware of the trade-offs of languages, but we do our best to navigate those trade-offs based on the data we see. I think based on the data we see, the top three that developers are using are C++, uh, C Sharp and Unity, mm -hmm. and JavaScript. And so uh, that's where the vast majority of our uh, development time is going. Brian Paris says our API is a thing of beauty as a JavaScript developer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Shout outs to uh, yeah, Peter mm -hmm. for that one. Also been Currently, how big is the development team? Uh, I haven't kept track. Um, does anybody have a number here? Or 80 plus. 80 plus? And looking for more talented individuals. Okay, you're counting the whole marketing and everything too, as yeah, a our team, our one team. Our yeah. whole company is 80 plus. I don't have an exact count. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're always looking for more passionate, talented people. So if you like working on this kind of stuff, check out our jobs page. All right, Sharon Pye is a Java developer. Good. That, that can help for Android, though. They're seeing some VR stuff in Android. Okay, so I can get back to the script. Um, so uh, we did want to talk more about after the tracking uh, and some of the architecture behind tracking. Um, so we talked about, you know, we, we take these images and we make at least some 3D marker-like things, not, not a point cloud or depth map, but some things to tell us. And then we track hands or tools within, the, you know, from those incident algorithm. And all this is hooked together. Um, through, uh, through a dependency injection in version of control library called auto wiring. Um, Which is open source. You mm -hmm. can go download it on GitHub right now. Yeah, so you can go to github.com slash leapmotion uh, slash auto wiring down this library and uh, explain what that is, you know, even for those who aren't C++ developers is imagine you're a, say, a JavaScript developer. You, you don't have to worry so much about this instantiation of things and, and their teardown. You just say require a, a, a module. At least you can do that in uh, it's a Node.js, right? Um, Python, you can do similar version of control things. Um, and in, even in Java Spring, there's a, you, there's a thing called auto, auto wiring. Uh, so you don't have to you know, worry who's responsible for instantiating something. You just say, I need something, and it's there. If someone already instantiated it, you can find it. That'll wire things together. Uh, it even features things like we have really a, not just wiring things together, we have a pipeline. Uh, and the pipeline can split off and join back together. So auto filter is sort of making up a big chunk of what auto wiring supports now, and that's that's supporting things like like even things like direction or Windows Media Foundation can be thought of as, as filters of pipes, and yeah. that that represents our pipeline. So if you're designing something, you know, say like a vision processing algorithm, you can probably relate to a library like this can save you a whole bunch of trouble of of how, and avoid your wiring to confuse things with the algorithms. It can really allow you to separate those out in a modular way, and um, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, you can download and try it out, and it's full of documentation too. Okay, so that covers what I want to talk about for, you know, how our service is reflected on the pipeline side. Um, after, uh, uh, now, at, at this pipeline, we need to, to send these frames, fingers, hands, and whatnot, to applications. Um, so we have this service, uh, or a daemon on Mac OS, and it's talking to apps through a library called lib.dll or liblib.dilib. Um, and it has to talk through some transport. Um, so uh, early on, we used... Uh, uh, we used a zero MQ. Uh, some C++ programmers might be familiar with that if, if you work in the world of, say, high-frequency trading. Um, uh, this, this is a thing, something that doesn't really replace TCP IP, but it provides the kind of uh, real-time guarantees you need that TCP IP doesn't grant. Um, yeah, it's like an abstraction layer on top of sockets mm -hmm. that lets you emulate messaging patterns. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, mm -hmm. a high-level message passing mm -hmm. library, mm -hmm. um, really low latency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we use that early on, um, and, and even that's that's really a rewrite of something before called AMPQ. Um, uh, but then uh, one of the authors there rewrote it into a thing called libxs. And we for the for uh, pretty much all of our development cycle uh, uh, from the public uh, from our you know first beta onward, it, we've been using Crossroads, which is very similar to zero MQ. Um, and then uh, in V two, uh, we finally replaced uh, replaced this library because. Uh, you know, despite it being good for f uh, finance in some use cases and running well on Linux, it had issues. It 
Crash doesn't even have latency issues on Windows. It was running because it was actually running on top of sockets. So then you have some of the downsides of WinSock. So yeah. uh, so we fully replaced it, primarily because for the image API we needed this high API. bandwidth. Yeah, low, yeah, high bandwidth, uh, low latency connection or with reliable uh, transport. So so it's been completely replaced now, um, which you know as as an improved you know, latency as well as as well as some reliability. Like some some systems would just crash because. There's firewall software, security software that says, oh, you know, I just can't handle the socket, and it would just kill it. So, um, so it's been fully replaced, and that's that's really a powerhouse behind uh, the image API. Um, so, um, okay, so that, okay, now there are some interfaces that still use sockets, like WebSockets. It's by definition, it's still sockets, and that's needed for JavaScript. And that's one reason we don't support the image API yet in in JavaScript, is it wouldn't have the, the kind of low latency requirement that people expect. Especially for uh, for VR and augmented reality. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So so I'm glad I got to cover auto wiring and uh, as well as our, our tra the transport. I uh, want to talk a bit about the API structure. As I mentioned, it's object oriented. You have a frame. Uh, sorry, you have a controller. You you get frames. Frames have hands. From the hands, you can clear the fingers, the wrist position, the palm position. You even query the forearm. Um, and from there, you can get fingers. And it's object oriented. So this is kind of like a hierarchy. And fingers, uh, you, you can get a uh, skeleton, so you can get the proximal, metacarpal, distal, I don't know all the bones. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, you can get all those. Um, and we have some gesture functions, so we used to, we still provide functions like circle gesture, uh, and the, uh, circle gesture or tap gesture, and people can still use these. Um, though we found in V2 uh, that uh, what worked better, and with a lot of things we experimented with, are things we call them widgets. Um, so the buttons you can find in a, in a demo, like Leap Motion widgets, um, there's a button there, and and the way it works, rather than having a pure gesture by itself, you're, there's actually a model of the object, uh, and the and and there's a model of the hand. That's a rigged hand. So you basically, which is basically a, using a physics model, and then there's an interaction. So you're actually using that entire model of of physics and uh, and collision detection decide when you're pushing a button or pulling a slider. Yeah. Yeah. And it works a lot better mm -hmm. to physically, you know, reach out and touch the slider and move it to exactly where you want than to just keep circling until the value gets to the, the value that you want. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we found that these really rich kind of natural direct interactions that are a little bit more physical, you know, not only is the learning curve lower because it's the same interaction that you would do in the real world, but it just feels better, you know? It just feels like I'm more in control of the interface. And so, um, yeah, we, we, a lot of our new uh, Unity applications, like the planetarium I mentioned earlier, make really good use of these widgets. Um, and yeah, I would encourage you guys to check them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and yeah, and it, I mean, it works a lot better, which is great. Um, one downside is it does require a rigged hand and a physics model, uh, which we have available in Unity, but if you suddenly program in Java, uh, you can't use that, and a lot of people there have fallen back to the old gesture API. Um, it's hard. I mean, one on the bright side, you know, as we move to VR, we're seeing just a lot more Unity developers, so as long as we cover most of the market, um, that, that helps a lot of developers. And the remaining 10% often tend to be the most advanced ones, and they're able to cut a rigged hand themselves. We've seen that. So uh, so, so there's hope there, even if, uh, even if the requirements uh, of, say, needing a, a collision detection and a full physics engine, or most much of a physics engine is required. You, are you planning to support pose detection for fingers? Uh, pose detection for fingers. So uh, so I believe pose, what people define as poses are less, less active things, like not tapping swipe. It's like detecting things like sign language. Um, well, I can't say anything about our future plans, but at this time we're focused on things like VR. Uh, VR isn't so much looking for th things like poses. I mean, early on, we there were people were looking at things, especially in some interfaces, you know, where poses are important. But for right now, it isn't as much as focus as things in VR like like interactions. Uh, now, there are a number of our developers doing things like poses, like uh, we have a uh, sign language company who's from our Leap Accelerator, Motion Savvy. And they've, uh, yeah, they've figured out a way to detect a whole bunch of different poses. Uh, uh, I think it was Rob, uh, Rob, the JavaScript guy, uh, I mean, Leap Trainer, so it, it, it has ways to detect arbitrary poses. Um, so, uh, so with enough research, we could improve that a lot, although it isn't a, a major focus at this time. 
Um, there was a question earlier um, about uh, is, the, is the peripheral the only device we make? Um, so it is one device we make, but uh, we also mentioned this device uh, is part of, this is found in the HP uh, NV Elite Motion SE uh, laptop. It doesn't look like this because it's just embedded and visible. It's also found inside the HP uh, uh, USB Leap Motion keyboard. So, yep. so we make, uh, so well, actually we don't make those, HP makes those, but we make uh, what goes into there that can make it magical. Uh, we also make, um, I showed earlier for integration with things like the Oculus, but also cardboard. Let me take this leap out here. VR mount. Yep, a VR mount. So uh, for $19.99, there's this, uh, well, <laughs> it's just so good that it holds the leap you know, in really tight. But um, this mount here um, can be used to attach to uh, the front of an Oculus. Um, uh, I think on the uh, there's some adhesive, um, uh, and that is useful for uh, sticking to say uh, Gear VR or the cardboard. Um, but for now, you could also save 19.99 and uh, 3D print it yourself. Um, but uh, but yeah, we this is actually a great deal in terms of just everything you need. It even comes with a spare extension cable. Yeah. Uh, so um, we've got the peripheral. We have the mount. We have a bundle with both the peripheral and the mount. We have the, the laptop with uh, the module built in. There's the keyboard uh, with the module built in. And then I think our most recently announced uh, product is the Razer uh, head mounted display. We have mm -hmm. a faceplate that has a Leap Motion module built right in. I would encourage you guys to check that out. It's called the OSVR. Uh, and I think that's our most recently announced product. So, you know, we're slowly building a family. And is there a guide to making your own hand models? Guide, yeah. Um, <coughs> let's see. Um, so sometimes the best guide uh, is our examples, example source code. People seem to want examples more than documentation. So uh, so our hand models are, are open source in the Lead Motion Core assets. Uh, I encourage looking at those. Uh, I believe there are some articles, perhaps by Matt Titel, describing the process of uh, of designing things like those, um, so yeah. And if you look at those, there's there's like multiple types of robot hand. There's a variety of uh, realistic looking uh, hands with like skin and you know fingernails, and you know there's a male one and a female one and multiple skin tones. And uh, I think that's it's called the the hand browser, hand creator. Oh. There's a there's a Unity. Uh, package, I'm pretty sure it's in our core assets or on the developer portal that lets you cycle through a whole bunch of different hand models. Um, that's in Unity. In JavaScript, we have a few examples. There it's a lot easier to make something yourself, and so you can take a look at our examples or uh, take a look at any of Isaac's code, Kabibo, and he's done a lot of work and really cool representations of the hand. Um, and there's also a rigged hand in uh, LeapJS, there's a rigged hand plugin, I believe, that lets you easily insert a rig pan into a web page, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then with JavaScript, you can actually, for an example, we use a thing like uh, CodePen. I think I think we should use CodePen. You can go there, see the code, you can edit it inline, it should refresh the page, yep. and play with it. Um, so, one great thing about JavaScript. We're posting uh, the rigged hand options for you to use, too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, someone asked about pointables, I think about tools, really. About holding like a, something like a pen in in my hand and tracking that. Um, so in V1, we actually had even more focus on, on tracking objects like like pens or screwdrivers. Um, so and that option is still present in the service. Uh, by default, it is checked off. And partly, you know, with our focus on VR, especially hands become more important. Uh, although people can use tools in VR. So if you if you uh, ch uh, check that box, uh, you can enable tool tracking. You can even disable hand tracking and, and track tools instead. So yeah, it's still available there. In fact, in V1, we didn't have the option to decide which one. So now, since we found that less than 20% of developers, actually, I think it's 15% of developers are interested in tools, 85% are interested in hands. So, but to satisfy both, we have a checkbox, and you can turn off hands completely if you really are hardcore on tools. And uh, the tools will certainly track better than in V1 because hands aren't interfering at that point. And that's an example of one of those developer uh, developer-driven. Uh, design decisions. So when we found that just not that many people were interested in it, uh, you know, we spent less time on it. So, you know, if there's any feature that you think is really important, feel free to reach out to us and, you know, we'll devote more time to it. Are there any other questions in the queue? Looks like our only thing left is to talk about some tools, some toolkits. 
Anything you want to say about Visualize, which you wrote most of the code for? Yeah, the Visualizer. Um, I mean, it's still the most reliable way to uh, make sure the device is working. So um, there's a lot of little quirks sometimes when it comes to, for example, the gesture API. Uh, it, you actually have to process uh, intermediate frames, even if your application is pulling gestures at a you know, different rate from the API. And so there's a lot of little things like that. And if you want to make sure that your app is getting all of the data, it's really useful to have the visualizer up uh, and then turn on whatever features you want to use and then confirm that everything that's happening in the visualizer is happening in your app. And so, um, yeah, and we haven't really devoted too much time to like making a new uh, version of the tool because um, it just seems to work mostly for, for what we needed to do. Uh, we do have a lot of cool ideas of what we could do with the visualizer in the future. Um, any feature suggestions that you guys would be interested in are, are very much welcome for that. Um, so if you have any ideas for like, oh man, I wish like, the, you know, the, the visualizer would leap enable that I could turn all the control panel settings with my hands, for example, like that would be a cool feature. Um, if you have any ideas like that, feel free to reach out and, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Yeah, it'd be one we call it diagnostic visualizer. And I think that's, that's still what it can largely be used for. Um, in V2, it's diagnostic power tremendous, increased tremendously largely because we exposed the image API. So people yeah. can finally see weird reflections or occlusion on things that were going wrong. Um, so just press F in the visualizer well, after you've allowed images in the, the control panel checkbox to, if you want to diagnose. And that's useful as a developer tool too. When things aren't tracking, look and see what's going on. Yep. Um, yeah, other tools, yeah, we covered, uh, yeah, we covered a number of examples. Uh, we talked about our image API, um, yeah. It really depends on the language you're using. So if you're in C++, uh, most of the developers we're finding like to roll their own solutions. Uh, that's changing a little bit now because there's things like Unreal Engine 4, which is in C++, and people are developing plugins for that. And there's actually an official Leap Motion integrated plugin into there. Um, but we do have auto wiring for C++, and uh, there is Unreal Engine 4. And we do have a few code examples on our uh, developer gallery. Um, when it comes to Unity, that's probably the one that has the most uh, bang for buck in terms of if you just want to start developing for Leap really quickly, then um, especially in VR, you're probably going to get up and running fastest with something uh, real in, in Unity just because there are so many uh, you know, assets and existing projects with source code out there. And so uh, you can get all of those assets on our on our developer portal or in the Unity asset store, I believe. And then, um, if you want to just do prototyping to see, uh, you know, what the device is capable of, or uh, if you're more interested in web programming, then check out Leap.js. That has a big uh, plugin system, so it allows you to extend it and add new functionality very easily. Um, so the toolkits that are available really depend on what what your language of choice is. Um, and luckily the ones that have the most uh, toolkits available are the ones that developers are using the most. So that's a good thing. Cool, covered our whole script. Looks like no further questions. Uh, shout out to last minute questions. Do you guys have any last questions? And then you guys can tell me if you work like what you do, <laughs> like what your software engineers do. Yeah, but I would love to hear more about from Brian Pierce, Carlo God, Jimbo Two Two Five, Jobo GM. Well, Jobo GM has been asking a lot, as well as virtual relations. Yeah. James and I are both engineers on our software team, so you know anything that you guys want to know about our software. Is the new Get package distri uh, what? distribution for C C plus C sharp API? I need to look up what new Get is. New Get. Get gallery. It's a package uh, manager. What other devices or technology are you working on? What are you looking at? Up? Other technologies or devices. Um, I mean, I guess our focus right now is to take the existing hardware, or maybe uh, you know, slightly different hardware, and really extract every last bit of you know tracking quality out of it as we can. 
And so that's our biggest focus at the moment is, you know, it would be really, really cool if one day you wake up and there's a software update for your existing peripheral that just makes it work a lot better. You know, um, that's, that's something that's really important for me and a lot of the people who work here. Um, and so that's, that's probably priority number one is just take the existing raw data and just get, you know, more quality out of it. And we, we're pretty confident that we can do that. Um, you know, obviously as we have new uh, betas of things, you know, we'll put them out. But, um, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. Um, then, you know, we, we did announce the, the OSVR project. So that's like an open source uh, VR initiative that, you know, we're going to be built into a faceplate that gives you, you know, uh, first person hand tracking and uh, the image API. And they have a plugin in, in development that lets, you know, makes it really easy to develop for this. Um, so that's something we're working on. And I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we're always doing new prototypes and uh, experiments and stuff, but right now our main focuses are making a really good input solution for VR and improving tracking quality for uh, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, those were our focuses. At the same time, we continue surveying developers, see what they're looking for, and we don't, we're not gonna disappear some, for a long time, come up with V3. We'll try to continue to have, have releases for things that needs to be fixed. Uh, got questions here. So NuGet, I found NuGet's a C Sharp or .NET package manager. Um, afraid we uh, we don't distribute through NuGet. We, uh, in the package manager I'm most familiar with, I guess, be Maven. Um, but yeah, package managers are, you know, even on Linux, we, we, don't have, we don't distribute through the app repository. So just best to go to our site, that'll have the, that'll have the official blessed one. And we will, uh, yeah, if you need C Sharp, just download it there. Um, and if you need C Sharp, that not 4.5, you will have to build it yourself since we're more focused on the Unity .NET 3.5 distro, but it's still possible. Um, Rafi covered a lot of the other device technologies we're working on. Some experimental, but some some real, are real in the world, like OSVR. Um, um, let's see, and virtual edition, you like the Android stuff? Yeah, that's ongoing. We're, we just like that to track, as well as the desktop, at the same time, as the desktop gets better, we'd like Android to meet that quality too, so. Yeah, the way I see that. it, the Android stuff is kind of uh, a big part of both of those goals because a lot of VR is going to be Android-based mobile VR, and so if you want to make a good input solution for VR, you almost have to have it work with Android or you're cutting out a lot of your community. Um, and then there's a lot of cool ways to use uh, Android-based tracking that's not in VR. So we saw one group who was using a phone that had a projector in it and they wanted to put tracking attached to the phone. Um, so they, when they're using the leap, they don't have to look at the phone screen, they're just holding it out at the wall and interacting with the projection directly. And this is a really cool thing. You know, you have a full computer that's making a huge screen on the wall and it all fits in the palm of your hand, right? Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's gonna come up like that uh, when it comes to Android. It's a really important thing for us. Okay. And Brian uh, Pierce asked, are we still building widgets? Uh, parentheses, especially for JavaScript, uh, both are true. Um, yeah, we're constantly <coughs> stuff like like Hovercast or uh, or uh, Planetarium. Like we we have a front end team who continually experiments with these things and releases open source examples. Uh, for JavaScript, Kabibo is all JavaScript still, so he's still gonna re re release new examples there. So the answer is yes. We'll continue doing that. So, <laughs> all right. Well. I guess that uh, wraps it up for the day. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. Hope you guys did too. And uh, reach out if you have any questions. Send us feedback. Send us feature requests. And uh, until next time. Until next time.